Take your Bible tonight. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter number 10. We're doing part 4 tonight on the nothings of silence. We've been doing a series on silence in the Bible. And uh, we have been uh, spending the last three messages talking about the causes of silence. And we'll pick that up again tonight. We'll pick up the 11th reason. It's self-restraint causes silence. Look at 1 Samuel 10, 27. But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. Let's pray. Father, bless the message. Help us to glean the truths that are here now. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Self-control can help a person to remain silent when he really wants to speak up and give someone a piece of his mind. In this passage, we find that King Saul was declared to be king of Israel. There were some, however, that rejected his authority and lacked confidence in his abilities. They didn't trust him. They didn't think he could do the job. Ever had anybody feel that way about you? Well, that's the way they felt about Saul. How shall this man save us, was their claim. These men of Belial, they were not godly people at all. They were very, very bad people. They were foolish. They were rebellious. They were sassy. Uh, If they had parents, they would sass their, their parents, okay? They were scoundrels that hated Saul. They could not stand him because he was in a position of authority. They brought no presence or financial support to him, and they were openly critical of him. All they did is gripe, 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 gripe. You know anybody like that? All they do is gripe, 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 gripe. Well, that's what these guys did. Saul's response to these scorners was silence. He held his peace, which demonstrated his wisdom and self-control in this matter. That's not easy to do when you're wanting to say something and you're biting your lip. Well, he held his peace. The tongue is like a wild bucking bronco. Wise is the man that can hold it still. That can be done only through the help of the Holy Spirit because no man can tang his tongue and its power. James said in this in James 3.8, he says, but the tongue no man can tame. Wow. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. It is wise to restrain your tongue just as Saul did here. Proverbs 21, 23. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from trouble. Do you know how to keep your mouth shut? Have you learned to do that? You know what? I think it's a lifelong experience. You know what? And as soon as you think you've got it licked, guess what happens? It gets you in trouble. I mean, it strikes unexpectedly. You know why? Because sometimes we get mad unexpectedly. Our temper just flares up at a moment's notice. If your tongue runs wild... It can leave you with nothing because of its destructiveness. Proverbs 18, 7 says, A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. Fools, they have a way of putting their foot in their mouths and choking on it. They speak before they think, which in turn, that's what leads to their destruction. Their words can cause great harm to others. I'm talking not just a few people. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people can be affected by the mouth of just one fool. For example, in 1899, four newspaper reporters from Denver, Colorado, they set out to tear down the Great Wall of China. 
they almost literally succeeded. What these guys did, they did what was been going on today. They promoted fake news. Now here's what they did. The four met by chance on a Saturday night in a Denver railway station. All by chance. They represented the four main newspapers of Denver, Denver, Colorado. And the editors had sent them out to dig up a story for the Sunday editions. That was their job. They were each at the railroad station hoping to snag a visiting celebrity. And to their mutual frustration, no celebrities showed up in Denver. One of them declared that he was going to make up a story and hand it in. The other three reporters, they laughed at what he said. They went over to a hotel to have some beers. And one said he liked the idea of faking a story. And one, uh, they said, why not have each of them do it? Why not, why, uh, why not uh, each of us make up a story? And instead of four fake stories, they said, why don't we all go together and make up one huge fake story? And that's what they did. A phony domestic story would be easy for people to check on that. So they thought up a foreign story. China was distant enough, so they agreed to write about the country of China. And one of them came up with this story. A group of American engineers stopped in Denver en route to China. The Chinese government decided to tear down the Great Wall. The Americans were bidding on the job. What was the reason for the demolition? The wall is being torn down to symbolize international goodwill and to welcome foreign trade. That was the story that went into the papers. These guys were thoroughly sloshed and they were drunk as a skunk. They were really knocked out. The reporters left the hotel. The four ha the papers all carried the story on the front page of the major newspapers in Denver, Colorado. The Denver Times trumpeted, Great Chinese Wall Doomed. Peking seeks world trade. That was the front page. It was phony, but other papers across America did what all of them do. They picked up that story. That was a big story. Then those around the world picked up the story. When the Chinese themselves learned that the Americans were sending a demolition crew to tear down their national monument, Many of them were just a little ticked off. Many of them were indignant, and some of them were downright en enraged. Particularly incensed were the members of a secret society, a group of Chinese patriots that despised foreign influence in their country. Inspired by the story, they exploded in revolt. They attacked the embassies in Peking and they slaughtered hundreds of missionaries throughout their country because of this fake news story. Within two months, 12,000 foreign troops invaded China to protect their citizens that were in that country. The bloodshed which followed sparked by a journalistic hoax invented in a bar room in Denver, Colorado became the international incident known as the Boxer Rebellion. Folks, words are very powerful. Your words are powerful. Nations have risen and fallen because of the tongue. Marriages have been destroyed as well as healed because of the tongue. Lives have been inspired and cast down by words. Choose them carefully lest they lead to ruin and destruction in your life. But that brings us to a twelfth cause for silence. It's found in 1 Kings chapter number 18 verse 21. 
spinelessness, shallowness, and slackness lead to silence. 1 Kings 18, 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. A study was done by scientists on a snake that had two heads. What they found out was that each head on the two-headed snake had its own will, its own brain, and its own desires. It would crawl in one direction, and in one moment it would do this. It would change direction and head in, a, in another way at the whim of the other head of the snake. Both heads of the snake were competing for control of the one body. Such a description speaks of many Christians today who have the same problem as a two-headed snake. They are double-minded and they struggle to make up their minds to live for the Lord Jesus Christ because they're trying to serve two masters. They're trying to serve the crowd of this world and seek their approval, yet they're trying to serve Jesus Christ. James described folks like this as unstable. And that means it's, that word unstable means restless, unsettled. James 1.8 says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Beloved, you can't have two masters. You can't do it. It's impossible. You're either going to have to serve one or the other. I think one of the most frustrating things my son went through when he worked at Kmart over here is when he had a, when he had a manager come in and the manager says, I need you to work on these shelves right here, get them clean, blah, 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 do all this work and everything. And then 15 minutes later, another manager would come on and say, no, I don't want you doing this work right here. I want you to work over here and do this over here and get all this done over here. And Josh, what frustrated him, he, was, he, didn't, he didn't know what to do, you know. One manager says this, another said this. So he goes over here and works on this, and then this manager over here comes along and chews him out. You can't serve two different managers. And you can't serve two different masters either, beloved. You know, at the top of Mount Carmel, Elijah spoke to the people. And he confronted these people about their double-mindedness, their indecisiveness, and their unreasonableness. He asked, how long do you halt or hesitate between two opinions? In fact, in the Hebrew language, it can be rendered this way. How long will you limp along between two crutches or twigs? The word halt carries the idea of wavering, tottering, swaying, or limping along. God's people were crippled by, by indecisiveness. They tottered back and forth between following Baal, which was a false god, a fake idol, and following the true God of heaven. They desired the best of both worlds. They were not sold out to the false god Baal, but they were not loyal to the Lord either. They enjoyed the sexual rituals of Asherah and Baal worship, but they doubted Baal's power. There had been no rain for three and a half years. And they would be saying, where is Baal? Where is Baal? Why don't we have any rain? Baal was, was considered the lord of the rain and lord of the harvest by the pagan worshipers. He was considered the farm god. When there was lightning and thunder, people would say, oh, there's Baal. There's Baal. The famine created debates. It created doubts and confusion and emptiness in the people. You know what? Doubt will make a person as confused as a termite in a yo-yo. One minute you are up and the next minute you are down. The price of compromise crippled the people spiritually. 
Their faith in God, it floundered. Their resolve for righteousness and doing what was right and obeying their parents and obeying God, it waned. Their sin was expensive as food and water had become scarce. The nation was destroyed and the people were dying. God's people were crippled by double-mindedness and indecisiveness. They couldn't make up their mind. And that's what Elijah was calling to do. Make up your mind and follow the Lord. Serve one or the other. Follow the Lord was the best choice. They were straddling the fence and it was time to make a choice. This was the purpose of the showdown on top of Mount Carmel. You know, beloved, there is no middle ground with God. None. There is no straddling the fence when it comes to your relationship with Him. The challenge was laid down and the shallowness, the spinelessness and slackness of the people led to a silent response from them when He confronted them with the truth. They were speechless. (coughs) Their response of nothing would leave them with nothing if they did not make up their minds to follow the Lord. Understand, beloved, that such behavior that these people demonstrated, that kind of behavior, it makes God sick. It gives God, it gives God COVID, okay? Revelation 3.16, So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I will vomit thee out of my mouth. Beloved, God wants us to make up our mind to choose Him. And you know what? If you want to have joy in your your life, when you make up your mind to follow the Lord, you'll get the joy you're looking for in your life. You will. Joshua 24, 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the God of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That guy made up his mind. Perhaps that's why God used him in such a great way. His mind was made up. Now we've examined the causes of silence. Now we want to look at the consequences of silence. You would think that basically nothing would happen from silence. On the contrary, a great deal of things do happen, as we will see. Some folks say this. They say, silence is golden. And there's a great deal of truth in that phrase. A survey of scriptures provides for us a number of consequences that stem from silence. Take your Bible, look at Numbers chapter number 9. Numbers chapter number 9. And we see, first of all tonight, silence gives direction in your life. It gives direction. Numbers 9, verse 6. And there were certain men who were defiled by the dead dead body of a man, that they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and before Aaron on that day. And those men said unto him, We are defiled by the dead body of a man. Wherefore are we kept back, that we may not offer an offering of the Lord in his appointed season among the children of Israel. And Moses said to them, Stand still, and I will hear what the Lord will command concerning you. So here was the problem. Two men were defiled by the dead body of a man, possibly from a funeral. They may have found it in the countryside. We really don't know. These men wanted to observe the Passover feast in Jerusalem. But God's law commanded that they could not keep the Passover if they were defiled or unclean. For this reason, the sepulchers in Jerusalem, in the countryside, the the people painted those tombs white on the outside before the feast in Jerusalem in order to avoid the risk of defilement. You couldn't even touch the tomb. Defilement was something that happened unexpectedly in most situations. But it did happen. 
Unexpected things do happen in our life, folks. Unexpected bad things happen in our life. Well, that's what happened to these guys. Beloved, life is full of unexpected events such as sickness, death, accidents, and setbacks in our life. These things happen all the time. We're to do our best to be prepared for the unexpected, especially death. 2 Corinthians 6.2 says this, I've heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. You never know when death will strike your life or someone in your family. You never know. That's why you're to be prepared for it. Uh, you may not even make it home. I remember leave, when we left um, when we left Monday morning to head back home to Illinois from the state of Texas. We always pray for God's mercy and protection when we leave. And no sooner we got on Interstate 20, we confronted a Texas driver. And uh, I mean, this one was wild, folks. I thought Tennessee was bad, but Texas is catching up very quickly. Anyway, we were heading home on the interstate, and I saw this one coming in my rearview mirror. I mean, he was coming full speed ahead, faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, <laughs> able to scale <laughs> tall buildings in a single bound, okay? I have that memorized, okay? <clears throat> anyway, this guy was coming, and I said, you know what? He's going to, he's going to, he, I was in the left interstate, I was in the on two-lane interstate, I was on the left side. He was on the right side, and I saw him coming. I said, you know what? He is going to come, and he is going to cut me off because a car was in the, in the right lane. And sure enough, he did. He missed me by a foot and a half. And, uh, I mean, it was close, folks. Man, did I want, boy, I, you think I, I was upset. I really was. But I was just thanking God for protecting us. I mean, we could have easily been killed. In that and an accident right there but you know what you never know when death will strike your way I've been on interstate 20 twice where a car is coming down my side of the interstate because the way they design the roads in Texas it's easy for someone to get confused and end up going on the wrong way on the interstate that's happened twice to me on the same interstate you never know when something tragic can happen. Well, these folks had a problem. And here's what Moses said. <clears throat> he says, stand still. He wanted them to be silent so that he could get direction from God on how to deal with this problem. Hey, do you think that's a good thing for us to do too, maybe? Maybe to just sit still and say, Lord, I've got a problem here and I really don't know how to handle it. I don't know what to do. Well, pray about it. Sit still. <clears throat> Moses was helpless in giving them an answer right away. We find ourselves in the same boat many times. I remember when we broke down probably, oh, maybe 25 years ago, we were driving to Texas in our, our van with our, our kids, and it was late at night, and uh, all of a sudden the, camp, the, the, the van went on strike. We only had 30 miles to go, and we would have been at Grandpa's house. But in Greenville, Texas, that van pooped out. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't know what to do. We were stranded in the middle of nowhere on the interstate. I said, Lord, I got out of the van and, I, and I, I sat on the bumper on the front of the van. I said, okay, I don't know what to do. And I need you to show us what to do next. Five minutes later, a trucker stopped. And he gave us a ride. And, and where we could get to a phone, we didn't have a cell phone at that time. And we were able to call Grandpa. And about 30 minutes later, Grandpa showed up. And uh, he was able to take the rest of the kids to the house. And then later on, they came back and they towed the van back in. But God gave direction. He showed us what to do. Next time you're stranded, maybe that's all you can do. Say, Lord, I'm in the middle of nowhere here and I don't know what to do. And you know what? God will take care of you. He will. You know, we find we are in those unexpected situations all the time. I don't like them. 
but they happen. The problem prompted immediate prayer to find out the will of God. And sometimes that's what we just need to do. Lord, I've got a problem. I don't know what to do. Just pray about it right then. Help. Lord, I need help. You know, here's a good prayer. Lord, help me. I don't know what to do. That's a good prayer. That's a very humbling prayer. But it's a good one. That is an important lesson for us in learning to seek direction from God, what these people did. Being silent at times will go a long way in helping you to discern God's will for your life. It is a great starting point. Be still. Silence can lead to nothing. It can help you to not have indecision, not have doubt, or not make the wrong choices. Those are good things we can do without. Those are nothings we can enjoy, not having those things in our life. Understand, beloved, that God is trying to get us to do the same thing as these guys did, especially when problems arise. We tend to scurry about with our plans when things start falling apart. That's just a natural thing we do. We start to scurry, trying to figure things out. But sometimes God says, no, here's what I want you to do. I want you to sit still. There are so many distractions in our fast-paced lives that rob us from discerning what the Lord is trying to get across to us, trying to say to us. Let me ask, do you need direction from the Lord in your life right now? Are you facing something right now where you, where you need God to give you direction in your life? If so, then hush and be still. Spend some time with the Lord. Get alone with God. Spend some time with the Lord in prayer. Read His Word and just give God the opportunity to talk to you. You know, silence gives discernment. Silence helps us to learn the Word of God. 1 Samuel 9, 27. As they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us. And he passed on. But stand thou still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. That's what Samuel said to Saul. It's amazing what you can learn from the Scriptures. You know, all this stuff about Russia going on, it's no shock for anybody who knows Bible prophecy. We know what's going on. By the way, you know who was in the news today about this Russian situation? Israel is talking now. Because the, there's Russian troops in Syria. So Israel's concerned about that. that. That is very interesting. But we do know one day that Russia and Persia, which are linked up, they're buddy-buddy now, they are going to attack the nation of Israel one day. You know, it's amazing what you can learn if you'll take time to study the Bible. It requires your attention. And that is why you need to sit still and think about what you're reading when you open the Bible. Scripture will help immensely to empty your life of foolishness and stupid decisions. Oh, we can be so stupid. We are we, sometimes we're just lunatics. And it gets that way when we start doing our own thing instead of doing what God wants us to do. Those things leave you with nothing but complication, chaos, catastrophes, and consequences that can scar your life for a long time. Those stupid, stupid uh, decisions and choices in your life, boy, they make a lot of problems. Silence also helps us to understand the works of God. Job 37, 14. Hearken unto this, O Job. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. You can learn a great deal as you ponder and study creation. Whether it's the study of the stars and planets, animals, plants, sea life, or the human body. 
No matter what it is, you can see the hand of God in His wondrous works. If we only study our own frame, our own body, we shall be led to exclaim with the psalmist, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and you are. Consider the works of God. Considering what God has done and has made is a strong antidote for worry and a great catalyst for growing in your faith. Emptying your life of worry will help leave you with calm, security, and confidence. God is your creator. God made you. In fact, you are so special, there is nobody on planet Earth like you. You're an original. Everything about you is different than from somebody else. God made you. Consider His wondrous work. You know, silence helps us to learn and demonstrate wisdom. Job 13, 5. Oh, that you would altogether hold your peace, and it should be your wisdom. Proverbs 10, 19. In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. You know, the last thing that you want to do is to say something foolish. For most people... That is not on their things to do list today. I'm going to say something stupid today. I'm going to say something foolish today. That's not on their list. Transgressions and offenses are unavoidable in the multitude of words. If you can't control your tongue, sooner or later you're going to stick your foot in your mouth. Too many words can create problems for anybody. Sooner or later we're going to say something we should have not said if we cannot learn to quiet down. That is why we should demonstrate self-control and just learn to be quiet, learn to listen. In fact, the Arabic word for refraineth is used in reference to placing a piece of wood in the mouth of a goat to prevent it from sucking. If you don't have control over your tongue, Maybe if you put a piece of wood in your mouth, you won't put your foot in it. It's interesting to note that the shortest inaugural address was given by the endeared George Washington. The first address given by the first president of the United States, that speech was 135 words. That's it. That's that's about one-fourth of, of typewritten page. It was nothing. William H. Harrison delivered the longest speech. It was 9,000 words. It took him two hours to give it. Of course, you know, at that time of year, it's very cold. And a freezing northeast wind made everything about his speech seem long. Those people's lips were turning blue as he was given his speech for two hours. Such verbosity caught up with President Harrison, however. The next day he came down with a cold, and he died a month later from pneumonia that he contracted from the two-hour speech. Beloved, refraining your lips is wise, and you will develop wisdom as you learn from other people. Abraham Lincoln said this, It is better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak out and remove all doubt. May the Lord help us to learn to be silent at the right time.